Hello. Okay, we're back for our final group of our famous, fabulous famous friends and families. Um, and we've got those four families that we're talking about. And the one is the Proteas and the Ericas and the Restios we've talked about. And now it's the most spectacular group because they're the prettiest of them all. And those are the Jewfites. Jewfites, a funny word, new word that we're learning. And, but we, we actually know the plants already. So let me get our lesson up here. And we can start. Alrighty, this is what our lesson looks like this month. Geophytes. And they say that Cape Floristic region is the geophyte capital of the world. Amazing. The Cape is known for so many things. The Cape of Storms, the fairest Cape and the Floristic Kingdom and the geophyte capital of the world. It's a special place. <laughs> Okay, so when we look at geophyte, is those plants that have something that grows under the ground, and that is usually a bulb or something. Think potato, think onion, think carrot. All of those things are geophytes because they've got something growing under the ground. Now, with the geophyte family, um, it's divided into different groups. I'm just quickly going over it. It's not so important that you know the differences, but for those that um, is more in, like the junior rangers and so on, you guys need to know this. But for interest sake, you guys can listen. So the geophytes are further divided into bulbs, corms, tubers, and rhizomes. Lovely new words for everybody. You don't have to remember all of this, so let's just look at a few. So yeah. On the left, we've got the bulbs. Now they say here the bulbs is the short stems. So that this bulb is actually part of the stem that is growing under the ground. And the leaves are swollen around the stem. And that is what is forming the bulb. So you've got here in the middle is the stem part. You see the stem part? And yes, it is. That's the part that can grow out and make the flowers and make the leaves. But around the bottom of this, underneath the ground, it forms these leaves. And we, of course, know them as, as the common old onion. Or you can, those are actually leaves, real leaves of the plant, but it forms the bulb under the ground. Okay. So, and what, what does this these bulbs and combs and stuff under the ground for it is to store food it's i always say it's like the plant's lunchbox under the ground it stores the food because not always right throughout the year does this plant have leaves some of them don't have anything above the ground and then they have to eat what they stored up because remember the leaves make the food bring it down store it in the bulb Okay, so this first one is called the bulbs, and they are like the onions with swollen leaves from the bulb around the stem. The other group is the corms. The corms is the stem itself that swells up. So this is actually just a old fat stem underneath the ground. It does have little leaves around it, but those are very papery leaves and they're not really significant like the onion one. Um, so this is just the, the stem itself under the ground, which swells up as it holds the food. Here's our other two groups. First, the tubers. Now the tubers can be a root or a stem that has become thick, that it's under the ground. So here we see with potatoes, it is actually part of the stem that is getting thick like that and storing the food. Now these ones, if you take potato, it has those little uh, nodes on them and another potato plant can actually grow from that. So you can take that and cut it into pieces. If there's a node on the piece, you can plant it and it will grow into another potato bush. 
These on this side is the root tubers. Can you see on the root, it has made the big old bulb thing where it is storing the, the food. Now another root tuber that we can think of, a carrot. A carrot is the root under the, under the ground and it's storing up lovely nutrition. The next one is one that we see often. Um, we don't even know what it is. And it's the, the rhizomes. If you start pulling out some a plant and you pull up all of these things under the ground suddenly and you see you, they're all connected. Those are the, what we call the rhizomes. It is also the root of the stem that is um, thickening up. But you see this one is growing horizontally and not vertically like a normal plant does. It actually grows along the ground, under the ground. Fascinating if you open them up under the ground and you see all of this. Okay, so examples of these uh, bulb plants that we know quite well, um, here's the bulbs as wild garlic. Sometimes they will have a tiny little bulb. Fire lilies. The other day there was fire lilies coming out of my garden. I've never planted them. There's no plant there. And then suddenly comes out leaves and a few weeks later, beautiful flowers. But I've never seen the plant there. There's, it's only there for a specific time during the year for a few weeks. And then the whole thing disappears and it grows from the bulb again the next year. The April Fool plant, I've actually got my April Fool plant here for you. So you can have a look at it. It's in a pot. Now this one, I'm bringing it closer because you know it's a bulb and we said the bulb is like the onion. Can you see that this bulb has kind of like onion leaves? There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Now it's not completely under the ground because I like to see some of it because it's so beautiful. But look at how the onion type of thick leaves form around the, the bulb. And these are the leaves coming out. I haven't had a, a flower yet, having to have a flower soon. But you can look at all these plants and you might know some of them. The uh, Watsonias, the spider lilies, freesias, your mom will know them. Um, Dysas that we see on the mountain, they've got those tubers going. And the rhizomes or the echopanthus, your mom will definitely know them. And the arum lilies, they've got those rhizomes. And sometimes you can just take a piece of that and the plant will grow from it. Let's look at pollination. Now these plants are so special and amazing when it comes to the design of the flower. It is designed like a special spaceship with special things to hook on and to release. And, and this is all for the pollinator. If the pollinator is a butterfly, when the butterfly comes on, it welcomes it. Sometimes it's got a, a, a landing pad for it. Um, it's absolutely amazing. You have to study the flowers to, and to know which pollinator will come there to know what all the parts are for. So now here's a picture of the the dyser, the red dyser that we find on Table Mountain. And they are pollinated by the Table Mountain Beauty Butterfly or the Table Mountain Pride Butterfly. And that's the only insect that will pollinate this plant. Now I've got some other pictures here that I want to show you um, where you can see better what actually happens here when this plant is pollinated. Here you can see the butterfly sits on the flower. Do you see these little yellow things? Those are the pollen sacs. Now as the butterfly sits there drinking lovely nectar from the inside of that flower, these sticky pollen sacs will stick to its chest and as he flies off he pulls that whole yellow piece out. Um, if he's successful. So he just needs to go sit there long enough for those sacks to stick to him and he will pull them out of the flower. So you will know when this plant has been, this flower has been pollinated 
um, when those sacs are gone, they actually move to another flower. And usually when a flower is pollinated, it will close up. My job's done. I'm pollinated, my seeds are ready to form, the flower can close up. Okay, let's get back to our other picture. Now, we, they talk here about the stigma. The stigma is the, the mother part, the female part of a flower. Stigma, the ma always reminds me of the mother, um, the mother part of the flower, of the Maria flowers form a flap that scrapes pollen off a bee's body as it enters. That sounds very complicated. So once again, I've got a lovely picture that I want to show you that we can explain this better. So look at this. If you look at this flower, the insect won't come and sit there in the middle. Those are just to attract it, those lovely purple colors. It has to crawl in there to get to the nectar. It will, it sees an um, ultraviolet uh, colors. So it will see this line and it will follow the line because all these lines in the way that the, the insects see points to the nectar. They will crawl in there underneath this flap and this flap scrapes pollen and it scrapes pollen off. It puts pollen in and scrapes it off. So that's how this flap is just there to kind of scrape the insects back clean or put some pollen there. Isn't it amazing? And look, look at the, the design of these flowers. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. Okay, back to our lesson. When it comes to seed dispersal, it's just as interesting. The March flower, you know the March flowers are the big one, the chandelier flowers? They've got at the ends of the flower, there's a thickening there, and this is where the seeds sit. Now this flower usually, you know, dries, and then it breaks off, and this whole ball can start rolling in the wind. And as it rolls, it just leaves seeds all over the place. And it's also tiny little dry seeds that get easily dispersed as it uh, rolls all over the place. So it actually also uses the wind to disperse its seeds. Clever plants. Some of the geophyte seeds are inside a fleshy fruit. Mm. So they hide it inside a fleshy fruit because they know they will be coming a little bird coming past eating that but the the inside the seed itself is so protected with a hard coating that the, it doesn't get digested inside the bird the bird just flies off and when it poops it out it poops out the seed and the seed is in a different location and it can start growing so the birds help and sometimes even the baboons wherever they poop there they, they leave the seeds. So they're like gardeners dispersing the seeds all over the paintballs. <laughs> Interesting. This is the acapanthus um, plant. This is the one with the purple flowers that look like kind of like an umbrella. Um, and it's also all over Cape Town. And they rely on the wind for dispersal because look at this tiny seeds, but these seeds are so, like paper. So they're so light that if you throw them in the air, the wind will just blow them away. So this plant also relies on the wind to disperse their seeds. They use animals, some plants use animals, some plants they use the wind. Plants are so clever. Let's talk about germination because apparently that can happen very quickly. Now, can you see these bulbs? are already starting to grow again. They're not even in the soil. Sometimes they can just feel water and warmth and then they will start grow, growing again. Um, now some of them will grow from seed in the ground, but they grow so quickly, um, they will, usually seeds will lay until the next year before they start growing. But these ones can start directly. If they just drop from the pl plant onto the soil, into the soil they will start growing immediately but they grow underneath the soil 
where they will be protected during uh, the hot summers. And in winter time, when it's cooler and they've had rain and everything's looking better, then they will start putting out a, a, first the leaves and then the flowers. Because they, they usually put the leaves out first to make extra food, because when you put out a flower, that takes a lot of energy out of your bowl. So they take their time under the ground. Look at my little mole rat here. Mole rats love eating bulbs and corms. They collect them and store them underground. Now mole rats are the moles that make the big heap. So if you're in the fowls or in my garden, if you want to see them, on the lawn you will see these big heaps of sand the next morning when you come out and that will be the mole rats. They're quite large, they can become quite like a small chihuahua. Um, and they are herbivores. They just eat bulbs. Um, the smaller moles are the ones that make the tunnels that you can see that run also along my lawn. So if you want to see them, I've got a whole zoo here. Um, and they are the carnivores. So they will eat all the bugs and the worms and the earthworms and all those things. But the mole rats are the ones that will eat your plants. They bring the damage. But they have evolved over time to um, actually even eat poisonous bulbs. You must never put a bulb in your mouth unless it's a potato and you almost prepared it, prepared it for you. Don't eat bulbs because a lot of them can be poisonous. A lot of people do use it for medicinal purposes, but then they know what to use. You can't just use anything. But these mole rats can eat some of them because they have, uh, they, they have come kind of um, immune against that, that poison that's in the, the bulbs. Okay, so they will survive. They're pretty tough. Don't eat a mole rat, might have poison in it. <laughs> Don't eat anything that comes out unless you know what it is. Geophytes love fire. After fire, they are usually the first ones to re-sprout. You remember those times of, with the burns over Okaab Sabah? Within a week, you could see not even a week, less than a week, you could see some of the geophytes flowering again. Um, they just love it. It's something in the chemical reaction of the smoke and the heat and that just uh, stimulates them to grow again. They say here yeah, that some bulbs can live for over 20 years before it reacts. Now in areas like um, Cape Point, we've had areas where um, people have thought that some bulbs have completely disappeared because that area hasn't burned for over 20 years. Well, in some cases, 15 years. But um, then suddenly there was an unexpected burn and then all of these plants came back. The, the researchers thought was gone forever. And they back, some were uh, dyzers, was it a year or two ago? We also um, saw a lot of um, new species. I'll show you a picture. Let me quickly show you those pictures and you will recognize some of you that were with us. You would recognize the... Mm, not here yet. Here they are. Look at all the different forms of geophyte flowers. Very complicated. You guys remember this little one here? A few years again ago, it was it, they just came out after the burn, and they were all over Cape Point, and the news was there. The researchers from all over were there to see them, and so were we. We were also there, and they were all over the place, and they weren't seen there for many, many years. I can't even remember how long. But um, we were so excited. But just look at all these beautiful designs when it comes to geophyte flowers. Colors, because they have to attract the pollinators um, and very complicated on the inside. Okay, let's get back to our lesson. We're almost done with 
geophiles. Oh, some of you might recognize this. These are water blumikis. People love eating water blumikis. Um, and they're also a, a bulb, a geophyte. Some people use it for med medicinal purposes. I've told you about that. Um, and there's huge uh, markets for the flowers because they are so beautiful, flowers for gardens. Um, they're all over the gardens, all over the world. They get um, exported from South Africa to all parts of the world because the flowers are so beautiful. It's definitely something to feel proud of. Eh? I want to show you what a, a little water blomik actually looks like when it's out in nature. Look at it's like like a, a water lily. It's grows like this on the pond. Look at the beautiful flowers. These little dotties. And this is the part that they use in stews. They will make it with lamb. Look at this. And it's a traditional meal in Cape Town. I grew up in Pretoria, so I didn't grow up with this. And I think I only had this about once or twice in my life. Um, but that's a, a very good example of a very popular um, Feinbos plant that's been used by people in the Cape. Now, I have tried uh, growing some um, geophytes and it's actually very easy. And I've got this video of a little girl, three minutes long, so watch it with me, so we can know how to, let me just see if I can get it up here. Hey guys, welcome back to Just a second. Okay, it doesn't look like I'm going to play it for you, but you can play it at home. Watch a short video and it will tell you how to take care of a, a geophyte if you want to uh, plant it in your garden. It's always easier to plant it in a pot because then you can um, watch it grow. So I've put mine in a pot. Um, the caterpillars and the snails did get to the leaves, but some people even do it in a glass um, vase, so you can see everything growing there. It's amazing. Try it and send me some pictures if you've got some beautiful bulbs in your garden. And that, that will be a great idea if you've got any plants in your garden that's growing from a bulb, is to share it with us so we can see it. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. See you again soon. Bye.